So it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm John Crusser. I'm in the School of Electrical Engineering here at Tech. I think it's fantastic that TEDx has come here, and I'm delighted that the organizers asked me to speak. We technologists, I think, uh, run the risk of standing too close to the technology that we work on. We tend to get jaded by the magic, uh, the miracles that surround what we actually do routinely. So I would argue strongly for all of us that we should step back from time to time, appreciate the world that we're working in, the things that we're working on, and how it's going to impact and change our civilization as a result in planet Earth. So that, uh, even if you're not a technologist, I would argue that a responsible global citizen should do the same thing, because it's really technology that's driving many things about our world today, things that everyone should know about. So I'd like to invite you today to wrap your brain, if you would, around the many miracles associated with the microelectronics revolution. If that feels a little bit of fuzzy to you, uh, let me make that a little more plain. Let's take not a 50,000 foot view of the world, but a 50 million foot view of the world. And let's do that in the daylight. And if you look at our Earth as we know it, you don't see any evidence of us. So it's a benign planet, uh, no evidence of our civilization. However, if you come back in the nighttime and look again, you would see plenty of evidence of us. So you see the urbanization, you see the electrification of our world, which is driven by technology. And as I will argue, microelectronics technology underlying all of that. So we see all of that there, uh, and it uh, is very clear evidence that we humans are alive, we're technically capable, we're doing lots of interesting things. If you play some Adobe games and morph that a little bit, Here's my actual point. So it's the same uh, view morphed into the surface of the Earth. And now if you look carefully, what you see is actually the microelectronics that span the oceans, which are driving the modern technological revolution, which is reshaping our planet uh, before our very eyes. That's what I want to focus on for a few minutes. So I think all of us intuitively know that the world is changing very rapidly around us. It's worth pausing and just considering that. It's a new world. First te text message sent in 1992. Uh, uh, this year, 10 billion sent daily. One in eight couples married in the U.S. last year met online. Uh, 40 billion Google queries monthly these days, which begs the question, who on earth answered all those questions before Google was in place, right? It's a little bit scary to think about. If you look at the cell phone, there's roughly th 3 billion of these objects on our planet, arguably a couple of billion too many. That's okay. Uh, but I think you could fairly argue that it's the most complex technical functionality per unit volume of anything humankind has ever created. It's a bold statement, but I think it's true. If I asked 95 out of 100 people how it actually does its magic, most people would scratch their head and say, eh, I don't know, I talk into it, I reach other people. I would argue that as responsible global citizens, we should have a much better feel for what our technology is, uh, how it's built, how it works, where it's going, and the miracles behind it. So you could take a brute force approach and say, okay, I'm going to take my iPhone apart. So you pull this thing apart, you deconstruct it, it's got lots of objects. Uh, the guts of this guy is actually shown in green. If you come in now and look a little more carefully, you see lots of black plastic things, which don't mean much. It's on the back side and the front side of this guy. But if you rip off, figure a way to rip off the covers of those black plastic things, you see very complicated objects underneath, underneath those. That is the microelectronics, and actually the functionality is in the microelectronics. And we'll probe that a little bit more for a moment. This is what you would see, a modern microprocessor. Absolutely complex uh, computational engine with onboard memory in the billions, right? So we've got billions of transistors per square centimeter of silicon dye, uh, which is actually providing lots of that functionality. And you might have four or five or ten of those uh, in a, a given object. So microelectronics, nanotechnology, what's the deal? What am I actually talking about? Well, step back a little bit. What I'm actually saying is that if we go from our macroscopic world, where you and I live, down several orders of magnitude to the microscopic world, now I'm talking a dimensionality of active things on the order of a millionth of a meter, a micron. And I'm going to build my electronic functionality that's in your cell phone or your laptop or whatever you're looking at down at this scale, which are the, roughly the size of dust particles and bacteria and viruses, right? That's a pretty remarkable statement in and of itself. If we go on down to the atomic level, the billionth of a meter scale, the atomic scale, 
I'm going to actually, when I build these things today, use nanotechnology uh, to actually wrap around microelectronics to embed its functionality in what we create. Now, I think most of you appreciate, but if you don't, you should stop and appreciate. Microelectronics and nanotechnology are driving the technological world, pure and simple. And it's profoundly changing the way our lives and our world are working, the way everything we do as human beings is being influenced by that, and it's happening in a very, very, very rapid way. It's kind of interesting. The most fundamental building block of all of this electronics functionality uh, is something called the transistor. Think of that really as a simple electrical on-off switch uh, that has a unique property of gain associated with it, meaning it can amplify signals as well as switch on and off. Uh, it actually has been around only for 60 odd years, and it's kind of interesting if you're a student of history that we can actually reach our finger into the historical record and place it right on the point and where all this started. I would argue, strongly, that the transistor is probably the most important invention that humankind has ever successfully pulled off, if, particularly if you measure it the way it's changing our world. Bell Labs, New Jersey, two days before Christmas, Friday afternoon, snow is falling, and these three gentlemen pull the, the Bell Labs management into their office and say, come look in the lab, we've got something to show you that's pretty cool. And this was it. It was roughly the size of their thumb, but it was the first solid state amplifying switch. That's where it began, 1947. For you students, that seems like a long time ago, but in the historical record, that's an eye blink. It just happened, right? The amazing thing, the miracle, if you would, is that from 1947, something the size of my thumb uh, today is something a couple of hundred atoms across. And I can build that in a very robust way as I will probe for a moment. So that's where things have gone. So if you think of this transistor, you have to reimagine length scales, distance scales, and speed scales. And I want to help you, uh, uh, help you appreciate that. So in the digital world, this transistor is really acting as a very fast, very small on-off switch. Simple as that. And today, one transistor might be 100 nanometers, a tenth micron, a tenth of a millionth of, of a meter uh, in size. And you say, well, that sounds like a small number, but how small actually is that? Well, if you compare that to the wavelength of visible light, four of these transistors will fit inside uh, one wavelength of the blue light. And you might logically ask then, well, how do we see what we made if it's smaller than the wavelength of light that we want to see it with? And the answer is you can't. You have to be clever and figure out a way to image that object, and we do that. So these things are tiny, beyond tiny, but they're also uh, in unbelievably fast. And so, uh, what we have now is a transistor can switch from an on to an off, a logical one to a zero, in about 10 picoseconds, 10 trillionths of a second. Sounds pretty fast, but think about that for a second. Everybody look here. So the transistor is switching on and off in the microprocessor, on to off, on to off. I've got a stopwatch that I'm clicking on and off as it goes. Here comes the fastest thing in the universe, the speed of light. And as it's coming by, I'm going to toggle it on and off. The speed of light actually only travels going 186,000 miles per second, only travels three millimeters in the time it takes your transistor to register a one to a zero. Effectively, we've taken the fastest thing in the universe and stopped it dead in its tracks. That gives you a sense of the speed of this. So tiny, speed of light fast, uh, and it gets even uh, more interesting than that. So you could ask a simple question, well, you know, of these transistors, how many are there? Well, that's an interesting question. People actually have vested interest in knowing those answers, and we have a pretty good idea, as a matter of fact. There is about 20 million, million, million transistors on planet Earth in 2011. That's enough for every man, woman, and child on the surface of the Earth to hold several billion in their hands, right? Because they'll fit into your hands. This is what he looks like. Thankfully, we have scientific notation to shorten that, but I like the zeros because it gives you this sense of the bigness of what we're talking about. The amazing thing is this. These transistors come at about one nanodollar per device. One nanodollar per transistor. Let me say that a little bit differently. I'll give you a billion for a buck. Now, there's not many things in life that you can get a billion of for a dollar, right? And that actually plays very strongly into the functionality of what's changing our world. So it's very important to appreciate that. Let's see how it comes about. 
So I'd like to take uh, the object, this is what's being made, the silicon wafer, which has the integrated circuits, the microelectronics on them. Let's just zoom in and take a peek and see what the transistor actually looks like. So this is an 8-inch wafer, 200 millimeter diameter wafer. I'm going to zoom in with an optical microscope, and you can see here's a particular uh, circuit or feature there. I zoom in. This is now a millimeter across. I still can't see the transistors. They're too small to see. This actually would go in the front end of your cell phone, for instance. Everybody owns one of these. If I now switch over to an electron microscope and image the object, I can't see it directly. Here's my transistor now. I'm down at the millionth of a meter scale. If I now snap this in two and look at it on cross-section just to see what it looks like, here's what you would see. Here's the surface of the silicon wafer. Uh, in the red circle here actually is where the transistor sits. And I've superposed for scale a family of influenza A viruses. And what you see is that the transistor today is the size of a virus. Speed of light fast, viral sized, a trillion, trillion, trillion of those on the planet. That's how something like the internet happens. All right? Now, to get this useful, what I do is take transistors and start to gang them up to produce electronic functionality. Right? I want to do functional things. I want to build a laptop, a GPS, a cell phone. The first integrated circuit, integrating them together, happened in 1958. It had four transistors, roughly the size of a dime. By 2011, on a square centimeter, I have 10 billion transistors right, integrated together. That's where it starts to get really interesting, because they're, again, free. And you can create something like this. Think for a moment about what the internet is doing to our world. It changes the way we, we interact, we bank, we do politics, uh, we go to school, educate. Whatever you point to that defines the human community is influenced directly by the internet. Point is this. It's the transistor and what's going on there which drives this object. Right? And that's worth appreciating, I would argue. You might care to wonder where Georgia Tech sits in the North American internet, hopefully at the center. It is pretty close to the center. There we are. That's great. So what I'm saying is you mean we went from one transistor to a full internet in only 60 years? That's true, actually. That's what's happened. And everybody on the planet should have only one simple reaction to that statement. Wow, that's amazing. But the perceptive person would have a second follow-up question and say, how did we do that? That's worth knowing. This is how it takes place. We start on the upper left. We work our way to the end. We start with the largest and purest crystals uh, in the universe that we're aware of, the silicon crystals. We dice them up into wafers. We put on these weird-looking suits, uh, and we, uh, we go into a production facility that takes $5 billion in capital investment, and yet you're still going to make a billion dollar a year on it, right? Uh, and then we produce these transistors. Now, 10 billion transistors per square centimeter. Uh, and now I'm going to gang these up uh, to produce the integrated circuit, which drives everything that we take for granted. Each of these 10 billion transistors has to work on that square centimeter. And it has to work with a performance tolerance, as I move across those devices, of maybe less than 5%. I would argue strongly that this is probably the most sophisticated and impressive engineering challenge that humankind has ever solved. That's why our world is changing the way it's changing. That's worth knowing about. Now, let me give you a couple of examples just to kind of level set to you for, for all that I'm saying. Uh, I'm going to take you through a history, I'm going to date myself here, and take you through a history lesson of my PCs. I've always prided myself on buying the very best computer that money would buy. My first uh, personal computer in 1992, only 19 years ago, uh, had was a 33 megahertz processor with 4 meg of memory and 128 meg hard drive. You couldn't take any application that you care about and even think about loading it on this. It virtually was an electronic typewriter. <laughs> but it was the best, and it was kind of cool, and we figured out how to connect it up to things. And you can see as my time evolution happens here, today my laptop is a, a dual-core multi-gigahertz processor with uh, you know, 4 gig of memory, 250 gig uh, uh, hard drive. It's got every, greater than everything I could think to put on there. The point is this. If I look at the ratio and performance of growth of that computer technology, it's 150x in processor performance, 1,000x in memory, 2,000x in hard drive capacity. So things have gotten, over 20 years, remarkably more sophisticated. You agree with that? The point is this. 
in, in uh, normalized dollars, my 92 PC and my 2009 laptop virtually cost the same thing. You mean you're going to give me a thousand times more performance and I'm not going to charge you any more to do that? That's exactly what's happened. That's worth thinking about. How has that been possible? Well, it's all tied to something called Moore's Law. Gordon Moore was the CEO of Intel back in the 60s. He made an observation that things, metrics which characterize this industry, microelectronics, grow exponentially. If you have a little bit of a mathematics background, what I mean by that is that things are changing exponentially, meaning they're the most rapidly changing function that nature presents. Right? So in another way, things get very small to very big very quickly, and vice versa. What Moore said was that the defining features of these technologies, uh, size, speed, cost, follow these growth patterns over time, which are exponential, such that exponential uh, computing power goes up exponentially while its cost goes down exponentially as a function of time. Over the last 40 years, uh, that's happened, continues to happen, and that's how we have our internet today. 2x growth per 18-month increase. That drives you to my earlier statement, a nanodollar for device. If you look at the cost per transistor over time, uh, out in 2011, we're looking at a billion devices per buck. Said another way, without much exaggeration, they're essentially free, even though it cost me $5 billion to build the facility to build them in. Right? That's pretty remarkable, and that's what's driving the world. Now, never before in human history, another bold statement, has any technological industry come close to approaching these exponential growth trends. That's the single reason why we have what we have today and the way the world is changing today. Let me give you a concrete example. If you take the Model T Ford, 1913, cousin of our rambling wreck, of course, uh, and you ask a simple question. If I mapped what happened in microelectronics over to the automotive industry and used the same growth trends, 2x per 18 months, what would a car look like today from 1913? It got, you know, it was 50 uh, miles per hour, 20 miles per gallon, you see as a sort of a standard car feature. You project those things, the same things mathematically on that that the computer industry has done, and you end up with something like this. You mean my car goes 145 million, 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 million miles per hour? Well, if the speed of light weren't there, it would, right? Uh, it gets a 50 million, million, million miles per gallon. It, it does. It costs a femtocent. It weighs a femtogram. Uh, it's larger than the Milky Way. That's what I'm saying, actually. The point is kind of makes you laugh, but it's actually a serious point. No piece of technology anywhere, anytime, in any civilization has come close to what's happened. That's why the electronics world, driven by these transistors, driven by silicon technology, microelectronics, uh, has done what it's done. It's changing our world. So here on your 16th birthday, your folks give you a thousand for you and your friends of cars. You put a picolator of gas in it, drive it for the next thousand years. Throw it away when you're done. Who cares? Questions I would argue that everybody should be asking. Most of you are students at Georgia Tech. That's great. You're in a technical situation. I would argue that your moms and dads, your brothers, your sisters, uh, lawyers, English majors, sports players, everybody should be thinking about these things because our world is changing as a result. How have we done this? How do these eight gadgets actually work? If you want to be responsible citizens, you should know that. How will civilization change forever as a result? What are the limits of all this micro-nano stuff? And where is it going to lead us as a human community? Now, both good and bad. You absolutely should be thinking about that. Better pay attention. The future of our civilization is literally in our hands. Let me leave you with a thought. Never before have engineers and scientists been so directly responsible for the direction of planet Earth really a true statement. That brings with it a sense of excitement and fun because it makes it a great time to be studying, learning, working in your career, but it also brings with it a sense of responsibility. Knowing more about this, what's going on, makes you a more responsible user of technology at the end of the day. That's a, a very important thing to remember. Well, let me leave you with this thought. So the model of, of, of Xerox Park. Now, if you graduated with a PhD in the 1970s, one of the places you wanted to be working was Xerox Park, the Palo Alto Research Center of Xerox, 
just below San Francisco. You got paid lots of money to put your feet up on the desk, drink coffee, and think of new ideas every day. That's pretty good. Uh, and this actually was stenciled over the door of that lab so that you saw that walking in and out every day. And it says, we predict the future not by some crystal ball, but by inventing the pieces of technology, the ideas which shape the future. Absolutely true if you think about it. So my invitation, my challenge to each of you would be, let's invent the ideas, come up with creative thinking that will define our future, hopefully in very positive ways. We have a responsibility to do that. For the first time, arguably, in history, we have the means to do that, right? Because we are shaping all of this. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and thanks for having me.